Welcome to Conversations with a Wounded Healer. I'm your host, Sarah Buino. I'm a psychotherapist, teacher, consultant, and most importantly, a wounded healer living and working in Chicago, Illinois. On this show, I interview folks in a variety of healing professions, and we discuss the intersectional journey of healing self while caring for others. We're not just focused on individual healing, but also healing on the collective level from white supremacy, late stage capitalism, and the patriarchy. Thanks for joining us. Hello, everybody. I gotta be super honest with you. Right now, in this time in the world, I'm struggling to have hope, y'all. I have been struggling with hope. I mean, there's been a ton of stuff going on in my personal life. There's a lot that's shifting and just the continued, I think, deluge of drama that is happening in the world around us. The Ukraine war, obviously COVID was still up and down and And just all the awful stuff that seems to be happening in the world. But you know what? I had the chance to get a wonderfully massive injection of hope this past week. So my BFF, Sarah Suzuki, and I have been doing trainings on anti-racism for a little while. And we got invited to work with the family medicine folks at West Virginia University. and. When we were first asked to go to West Virginia, who doesn't have a stereotype of who a West Virginian might be, right? And my stepdad is actually from West Virginia, so I did spend a little time there growing up. So Sarah and I were preparing for this. We thought, oh, we're going to get all this pushback and there's going to be so much ignorance and yada, yada, yada. And first of all, we got there and our host, Barbara, could not have been a nicer, more wonderful human being. Not that we expected that she wouldn't be nice and wonderful, but It was like above and beyond just wonderful. And we got to do a presentation for the residents who, if you don't know how the medical school system works, so residents are, they're about to become full-fledged doctors. And this residency is their last thing that they have to do in medical school before they get to be full-fledged doctors. And so they're all fairly young. They were so open. They were so inquisitive. They were so introspective. And it was so inspiring to see folks who are the next generation of healthcare providers in a place like West Virginia that has a lot of barriers to access to care for tons of different things. But to see these people really lean into the information, to the vulnerability that we were asking them to lean into was just so incredible. And then the next day, We got to do the presentation again for the attendings and the nursing staff and some other administrative staff. And I got to tell you, it warmed my heart. And I wanted to give a special shout out to the folks who took us out to dinner. Just I couldn't be more blown away by the lack of pretense, just the ability to connect, to have fun. These people love what they do. And it was so beautiful to see healthcare providers that are taking care of one another. So special shout out to Dr. Carl Schrader, Dr. Erica Bodkins, Dr. Barbara Kubik, who was our main contact, Blake Brookshire, Alan Rickards, Gabby Ponzini, I think, and Olivia Frazier. They were so awesome and amazing. And I hope that some of them are listening to this and are like, oh my God, I just got a little shout out. Yay. So thank you. And I hope that I hope that we can all find some hope. But it just reminded me when I had the experience in West Virginia that I'm not alone, right? Sometimes I feel like I get in the struggle and nobody else is doing the work or I see folks around me just acting like everything's okay and the world is not okay right now. But you know what? This experience that I had reminded me I'm not alone. There are other people doing the work. There are other people doing other different, great, important, amazing work. And it was just such a blessing to be with those people. So if any of the folks from West Virginia are listening right now, thank you so much. You absolutely made more than my day. I don't even know how much TBD for how much of my day, week, month, year you made, but it was absolutely incredible. So thank you. Now we shall transition to today's guest. This is also this whole month of May is just a very interesting collection of healers here. But today we are talking to Megan Thomas and Megan Thomas is a boudoir photographer who specializes in identifying the unique beauty 
of each client she engages with. In every image, she wants to see evidence of the ravishing soul within so that her clients can see it too. So I have a feeling you're going to very pretty quickly pick up on why I think Megan is such a perfect guest for the show, even though she's a photographer that we wouldn't necessarily think of as a healing profession, but just wait and see. Please enjoy my conversation with the lovely Megan Thomas. Work is not supposed to hurt, but after two years of this pandemic, healthcare professionals are tired. My dear friend, Mishara Winston, who you might remember from episodes 53 and 150, she's always been an adventure therapist at heart, and she's currently offering a choose your own adventure experience to reconnect with your own inner GPS. Crave is a three-month deep dive into self-nourishment for healthcare professionals, restoring balance, boundaries, and body honesty. If you loved Mishara's message on the podcast, you'll get the nourishment from Crave that you deeply deserve. Visit www.misharadwinston.com slash crave for more info. There were birds that just were chirping, and I just have to say that. I'm so dumb. Hold on. No, don't be sorry. It's so beautiful that I want my editor to keep it in. No. Okay. You didn't need to do that. It's okay. Did you want them? I mean, yeah, I love it. It's up to you. Okay. (laughs) I I like birds. That's why I have. (laughs) I'm actually weirdly a bird lady. It's like a little known fact. Like I'm that girl who like, I started looking up species and I like yesterday saw an indigo bunting and I I was on the phone with my sister and I was like, (gasps) she was like, what? I was like, an indigo bunting. And she was like, oh my God, shut the fuck up. That's funny. (laughs) I hate looking at birds. I hate having them around me, but I love listening to them. Interesting. Okay. There's a joke that I would like kick birds if I could. I wouldn't actually, but there's just a joke that it would be a very satisfying like sound if you got to like kick a pigeon, right? That is so, it's so animal cruelty. No, no, no. It's oddly specific. And I've said that exact same thing over and over to multiple friends where I'm like, I just want one time where I can be guaranteed it wouldn't hurt them. But I really love to kick it like a football. Like, I really want to see how that would feel, how it would sound, what it would look like. Right. And it's just like they're tempting you when they're down there. And I love birds. So it's not like I want them to hurt, but I do want to take one. Yeah, I don't want to hurt them, but I do want to kick. Yeah. So I'm glad we're on the same page about this. And you are. I've just never heard anybody else say that except for me. (laughs) Okay, good. And now the whole world knows that we're bird kickers. (laughs) So hi. Animal cruelty. (laughs) Right. This is Megan's intro to conversations with the wounded healers. Hi, I want to kick a pigeon. So uh, (laughs) do you want to tell folks anything else about you? (laughs) Surely lots other than just that. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I am a boudoir photographer. That is actually how you and I met. And I've been doing that for going on seven years now, full time. Yeah, yeah. So you said we, that's how we met. So we'll tell the whole story on here so everybody knows. So my BFF, Livia, who everybody knows because she was on episode 134, I think that's the number. She knows someone named Nicole who had a photo shoot who Livia also just randomly was like, you need to be Facebook friends with this person. I don't know why, but you just have the same sense of humor. So I don't even really know Nicole other than a few Facebook conversations and likes on each other's posts. She's fantastic. (laughs) Yeah. And she had posted these drop dead gorgeous photos. And she is a woman with curves. And I was like, ah. If she can make her look like that, I bet she can make me feel better about myself the way that I look. And so I reached out to you and I wanted to get it's not not naked photos. That wasn't what I reached out to her for. But we did do some naked photos. We may have done some naked photos. We may have done them. <laughs> but yeah, so we did these branding photos and just the way that you were talking about women and their beauty, that was really, really healing for me. And that's what made me want to have you on the podcast, because I can only imagine, you know, what you did for me is what you're doing with, I don't know how many hundreds of other women you photographed over the past seven years, right? So talk about whatever you want to talk about in that regard. Yeah, it's funny. Actually, I started in photography and weddings. And then my brides 
essentially approached me were like, do you do this? And I was like, well, that sounds like a lot of fun. Champagne, get half naked, get it's like adult dress up. And so I started taking them and like renting a suite uh, for a weekend and I would just do as many women as I could. And then I realized at the time I didn't have a studio and I was like, wow, this is really costing about the same to just have it for a weekend or two as a studio would. So why wouldn't I open a studio? And I had no idea if I could be that niched into right. photography, but it turns out you can. <laughs> Yeah. When you're that good. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> when I realized that what happened in the hotel suite was so powerful, but it was truncated. So for instance, if I had the suite for Friday through a Sunday, I was shooting a couple clients the night that I checked in, then I'd have the full day on Saturday. And then I would maybe do one or two before I checked out. But it was quick. It was like, come in. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Megan. Nice to meet you. Okay. Let me see your lingerie. You got a quick face of makeup. And then we got going. And so I recognized that by like the end of the hour, we were really getting some powerful things. Mm -hmm. And I realized I'd really rather this be dedicated in a bigger way to my clients, not so much a turn and burn as get people in, but yep. really give one woman my whole day. You know what I mean? And so that's why the sessions lengthened out to four or five hours. And then I opened my studio. Well, tell, I guess, do your spiel about posing because just the way you describe it is fucking healing. So describe it. And we'll post a couple of my photos, maybe, so people can see them. <gasps> yes. Um, I, I haven't that. released them to the professional world just yet because I was saving them from my website, but we'll release a couple that show what you're talking about. So, okay. Yeah. Do your spiel. My spiel. So one of the things when I opened my studio to go specifically towards boudoir is I realized <laughs> these, these women are going to be half naked. So I did not want any of the posing to use words like be sexy, be passionate. I didn't want them to be performative at all. I wanted them to be concrete. I wanted it to be something I could tell like an elementary school age person to do and they would know what to do. Not that, you know, I would because that's creepy, but <laughs> different situation, <laughs> different situation. But right. cognitively, right. I wanted the posing to be very much, very easy to follow. And so I started researching and I realized, wow, there are actual biological reasons that the posing translates like this. And can I connect those dots? And so you've heard this whole spiel, but, you know, I talk about how boudoir is the most posed form of photography because I'm looking at so many different points in your body all the time. But what makes it look sexy is it looking like I spontaneously just caught you in this moment. So mm -hmm. interestingly, the boobs, the butt, all the things, those just kind of do what they need to do. So hands are actually more important. So if your hands look stiff on your body, mm -hmm. you look uncomfortable, which makes a lot of sense because if your soul inhabits your body, why would it look odd for you to place your hands on it? That should be a familiar space. It should be more familiar to you than anything else that you think of as a familiar space. So there, obviously, that's a biological reason that it looks less posed if you look more comfortable. And then comfortable just breaks down to looking vulnerable, mm -hmm. but comfortable at the same time. And that's what ends up looking confident. And so vulnerability is done. You're already half naked. So we don't have to think about that. So then it's about looking comfortable. And one of those is your neck and shoulder area. If your shoulders are up to your ears, you look uncomfortable. You look scared. You look like you're gearing up for something. If you can relax your shoulders and really let them drop down and back, you look a lot more present, confident, and like you're in control of the space. You are affecting the space. The space is not affecting you. And that's biological, right? Our heads are connected to our bodies by our necks. And so when we're nervous, we want to protect one of the most sensitive parts of our body. Exactly. Shoulders go all the way up. Because if this gets separated from your body, then you're you're in trouble. That's a problem. <laughs> you're in trouble. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> and so making sure that your shoulders are nice and relaxed, that visual cue from someone who's looking at you is going to look at your shoulders and go, oh, they are very comfortable in their environment. And there are also physiological things that happen. You and I talked a lot about breath work. But there's really something to being able to drop breath into your body and then really let it exhale all the way out. I have found in my work that we are very good at inhaling, but we do not like exhaling quite as much. So we really like the feeling of air coming into our lungs. We like a big, deep breath. But then when we exhale, we tend to go and stop right about 50 percent. And then we inhale from there. So all of that breathing stays really chest mm -hmm. level. None of it actually drops deep into your body. But if you can let that breath drop all the way in, it will improve your blood flow. Your heart rate will lower. There are literal biological things that will cue your brain to know, oh, I'm comfortable here. I'm not scared. I'm not nervous. 
my body is telling me I'm safe. Therefore, I can Mm -hmm. take this picture, you know, and that Mm -hmm. has been really I think the thing that proves it over and over and over is that I see this regardless of your age, your demographic, Mm -hmm. stay at home mom versus CEO. It doesn't matter what fabric of life you come from. This is a human species type of understanding as far as how our bodies work. Mm hmm. Yeah. And it's so funny because you had even said a lot of the things I'm going to ask you to do are going to feel very uncomfortable. And mm-hmm. you were so right. But it does not <laughs> look like that. It's like point your toe. But I know you're wearing a boot. So you can't really point your toe, but do it anyway. Yes. And stick your butt out. Arch yeah, your back. Stick your butt out. <laughs> right. Like all of these things. But really, I wept when we were looking at the photos because I was shocked. I hadn't seen myself you know, of course, I gained weight in the pandemic. I've been going through trauma recovery over the past several years. So I've gained a lot of weight and I have really struggled to look at my body. But that's the first time I've been able to see my body and go, oh, that's beautiful. And yeah, probably four or five years. That makes me want to cry. (laughs) That makes me so happy. Yeah, I think that's amazing. And I think that's the thing is you don't realize you have a relationship with your body. I have such a different perspective on that now than I did before I started shooting. Mm -hmm. And people always talk about how, oh, other people's opinions don't matter about you, whatever. One does. And it's yourself, your own opinion of you. And so I think that's the goal. We can't just snap our fingers and unlearn all of the conditioning, too. You know, absolutely. And that's the thing is it's not going to happen to you. You are not going to fall into a healthy mindset. Like, that's why you have a job. That's why I have a job. Right. It is something you have to choose. Because you are, you're exactly right. You are bombarded with hundreds of thousands of messages all the time from advertisers who are trying to take your sexuality, bastardize it so that they can move their product. The only way they can move their product is if they've convinced you that you're not skinny enough, young enough, smooth enough, tall enough, whatever, fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. And it's super effective. I mean, our brains, they've literally gone based on how our brains are wired to deliver this messaging. So unless you're being pretty offensive on your side to solidify how amazing you are, how beautiful you are, your self-worth, it's not going to end up landing there, unfortunately. And that's something that when my girls come in, I'm not looking to take one session and be like, no, you love everything. But literally, I think my biggest goal is to remove contempt from your psyche. If you can go from the contempt of I hate this to it's not that bad. My legs actually look pretty good there. That shift, I truly believe love has a really hard time existing in spaces where contempt also exists. I think they're like oil and water. And so again, if it's just a matter of like lowering that intensity from this uh, to, well, it's not my favorite or I'd like to work on it, but I like it here. And, I, you know, like, I think that's really what I'm trying to add to the conversation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think that's it. It's pausing, it's slowing down and just recognizing that I Probably 10 years ago, wouldn't have told you that I was saying anything negative to myself about my body. But once I started actually really tuning into my self-talk, it was horrible. And truthfully, Mm -hmm. it's still horrible. And it's interesting because I'm doing a lot of anti-racism work right now and I'm learning more about ableism. And so Mm -hmm. there's this connection with ableism and fat phobia and white supremacy that all kind of swirls together. And this is the system that, of course, we're all living in. And If you're anywhere around my age, you grew up looking at like Kate Moss being told that that was the way a woman's body was supposed to look. And with my curves, I was never even as as thin as I could ever be when I was 100 pounds. I was still curvy and had really thick thighs. Like Mm -hmm. that's just how my body is built. And so I love and I'm curious your thoughts on this, too. I love the health in any size movement and how advertisers really are using different bodies now. I'm curious what you're seeing. Oh, it's a huge win. It's literally game changing. Mm -hmm. You don't realize. And again, it's conditioning. It's a shitty parlor trick, the way that advertising works, because none of the consumers are aware of how. And that was your previous gig. Yes. my Actually, that's where I came from is advertising. That's exactly right. Yep. So us as consumers, we aren't opting into any of this. The way it's messaged, how it's going to imprint on your brain, the way it changes your psychology. We are unaware of what's happening and they are very aware of what's happening. And so seeing one of the things is just putting it in front of you. Because again, you could pick another time in history. There was a time where being as fair as possible and as and curvier meant you were rich. It meant you were so desirable. You didn't want to be skinny and like tan because it meant you were served. You were you know? a servant. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. So understanding that beauty 
it's two things to me. It's a shifting sociological thing. And then there are actual things that are aesthetically pleasing overall to us as humans, color, symmetry, smoothness. So that's kind of two things. But the first thing is definitely taking the second thing and using it against all of us. Um, But Mm -hmm. seeing bodies that are not photoshopped, that are all different colors, all different sizes, I can't overestimate how important and how vital and what an impact that will have. I will be very, I mean, at first it was just, we all had Lizzo. Lizzo showed up and was taking us all to church every day, you know, trying to talk us through how to love our bodies. But no, seeing this actually roll out. Do my hair, check my nails. <laughs> Don't do me, Lizzo. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> I feel like she wouldn't. Although it'd be cool to be sued by Lizzo. That's, that's anyway. true. Yeah. <laughs> so I definitely think that that movement is super important in every way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Do you know who Shuglet is? I don't. Okay. I think, and I don't know their pronouns, so I'm just going to use they, them, but I think they're also in Atlanta and they are, I believe, a black, queer, somewhere on the non-binary spectrum person who photographs really full-figured people of color. And it's so interesting because the thing that sucks is when I see those images, I react with all of the conditioning, right, that's been in the advertising And I react that way if I see someone else's body, if I see my body. And it's something that I know that we have to see more images of different bodies in order to really have it start to sink into our psychology. But I'm not there yet. So I think it's so important for artists like Shiglet to put those photos out there so we can start retraining ourselves. Yes. Well, and I was going to say that the beautiful thing is that the kids that are growing up right now will not have the same narrative, right? which kind of sucks for us. But on the flip side is this beautiful invitation that we actually get to view what's happened and then replot the land internally. And I think there is something, if we're open to being a part of that discussion in ourselves, I think there could be a lot of treasure to that conversation. So I'm actually really thankful I get to see the change. If you told me 10 years ago that Target would have full figured models and have no Photoshop, I would have told you you were fucking nuts. Like there's yeah. no way. And so I think that there's a real gift to being able to just see it and watch it happen and watch the impact of it and then get to watch the kids of this generation grow up with this different messaging and see exactly because that basically means we're going to get a really unique view of the damage. Yeah. And that's a really unique opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, they're still going to be fucked up because they have social oh, media totally. and we didn't have social media when <laughs> yes, we were growing up. Yes. So it's like there's this very dramatic contrast of we're getting to see advertising be different now, different body, different color, all sorts of representation, different abilities, all those sorts of things. But social media still favors this perfectly curated life and the influencers and all that stuff. So I'm interested to see the amalgamation. <laughs> Yes. That sort of comes out of that because will children grow up feeling more empowered about their differences? I don't know, because I feel like the lens of social media is so strong. There's more hope. Well, I don't know. I don't, I don't mean to be a Debbie Downer. It's like there's more hope no. but at the same time. Like, I don't know if there is. I think we're just going to fuck up everything because that's just what humans do. We're totally going to fuck up everything. End of podcast. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> no. I think that you're right that there is obviously a really big lens towards perfection and curating your life. But I think that narrative is also being very scrutinized. And I believe that you can also watch history, right? Like we look at the boomers and we have these opinions about whatever, and we don't want to look like that. And so I think the ones that are the most in trouble are the ones between our generation and the kids who are maybe five years old right now. Those are the ones that I have more fear for. But I actually believe that those five and younger are going to swing the pendulum the other way. I think that the Instagram thing will look old because that's what happens. All of us with white kitchens in 10 years are going to be the ones with white kitchens because it was like a fad. But no one at that point will want a white kitchen because it will look old. And so I kind of think that there may be something with that. Because right now, if you look at influencers and whatever, there's been so much fodder put out for us to ingest and consume that it's, they look the same. They're all beautiful vacation pictures with some skinny blonde and a bikini. So Mm -hmm. no shade, but I think that the 
ones who are coming up under that are going to value the different. I think the potential is going to swing the other way where you, again, you don't want to look dated. And the only way you look dated is if you're standing on a beach and, and got this pointed toe model pose. I'll be curious to see how that all plays out. But I think there is going to be absolutely some devastation as, I mean, we've already seen like suicide rates are up for teens and all of those things yeah. like horrible. But I think that there will be some beauty. I do think the pendulum will swing. I'm just curious what it looks like. Yeah. I admire your optimism. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm laughing because I just well, no, don't Karen's have it right now. <laughs> I do tend to find that silver lining. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm interrupting this awesome conversation to share about an upcoming opportunity for mental health professionals. Cohort one of Wounded Healers virtual group has been really amazing. And I am so excited to keep the healing going with cohort two starting in June. In our lifetime, it has never been more challenging to be a mental health professional. Our jobs, our clients, and our communities place various demands on our energy and spirit. But in order to offer our best, I believe we must take care of ourselves and do our inner work as well. As wounded healers, we're called to attend to our own recovery and transformation in order to support the healing of others. Wounded Healers Virtual Group is an eight-week support group for mental health professionals led by me. In this group, we will create a sacred container to support one another's healing, integrating spirituality, principles of the neuroaffective relational model, shame resilience, and liberation psychology. We'll use the chakra system as a frame for our weekly meetings. Cohort two meetings will be held on Zoom Tuesdays, starting in June, June 7th. For pricing and information and to register, please visit www.tinyurl.com slash woundedhealersvg-2. That's tinyurl.com slash w-o-u-n-d-e-d-h-e-a-l-e-r-s-v-g dash the number two. Change of topic because I I would love for you to share your story with listeners. What has been going on for you for the past couple of years and then what's shifting and what you're doing next? Yeah, so I went through a divorce last year. I am convinced that is definitely one of the most traumatic things you can go through for a reason. Because last year was so hard, that was really proud of myself. I was proud of how I showed up. But my marriage was the hardest thing in my life. My job's amazing. My friends are amazing. My life is amazing. But I really had to work at marriage. And when I realized after we'd gotten a therapist, a psychologist, a psychiatrist, like lots of professionals involved, that this was not going to be a thing and that I really was done. I promised myself that 2022, which was supposed to be the year that I was going to have a family, get pregnant, yeah. you know, would become the year that I said yes to anything that delighted me, that inspired me, that push creativity or joy or peace. Like it was a present to myself. It was a whole year of saying yes to anything that I'm like, ooh, like, yes. Even if it's something as insignificant as I want to use the pretty coffee cup in the morning. Yes. yes. To, I want to take a three month trip, which I'm doing. <laughs> yes. And so I realized through this transition from going through, and I'm, I'm sure your listeners can appreciate when you go through those real shit seasons, like the ones that are dense and long and heavy. And every time you think you're at the top of the mountain, there's another fucking curve and there's another steep incline. And you're just like, how big is this rock? Mm -hmm. Can we please be done? There is something really beautiful that happens when you kind of crawled out of it as your energy starts to return, as you start to sleep better and eat better and kind of return to rhythms that were positive and then maybe create new rhythms. It just frees up all this space. And so I have been yelling at my clients for seven years, like, love yourself, like, dedicate time and resource. And I haven't done it. And so I was like, hey, you should really take that advice you're giving everybody for seven years. I think it's like 700 clients that I've shot right now. And so I am. And that's one of the beautiful parts about when you came for your session is I was definitely in a space that was very different than where I was last year and really feeling like I'm learning alongside my clients, but also recognizing the gift of getting to hear people's story and getting to mm -hmm. getting to hear it, but also being in a spot that's dense and dark and being able to appreciate others from that vantage point had a big impact on the connection. I always feel like I connect with my clients, but I feel like the clients I have had the past year and a half, that connection has been deeper. 
because the human experience is something that resonates in all of us. We all have been in those mm-hmm. moments where we're like, oh my God, I can't. And then we've also had those effervescent, beautiful, bubbly moments that seem like you just want to grab onto them because they're so fleeting. But being able to connect around those moments is something so powerful. And so I feel like it's been this added bridge to my photography that has really enhanced the experience for both me and I think for mm-hmm. my clients. Mm-hmm. And that's obviously when you when you came into yeah, the studio. Yeah. I almost want to, I don't know if it's deconstruct or deepen. I would love if we could unpack, I guess, what is it that made the connections deeper once you went through your deep, dark shit? I think part of it is your own personal vantage point. So I shared this with you when I was at your session, but I truly believe that everyone has a certain amount of space, a certain container for their significant other. And honestly, that would spread to not just romantic relationships, but any relationship, right? That size of that container is directly related to how much inner work you have done. So my container for others is based on how much inner work I've done. So if you've done no inner work, you got a really, really small container, which means that everybody around you is going to have to squish themselves down, be less beautiful, less dynamic, less vibrant, because you can't handle all of them. The more work you can do, you can get to the point where you have like a soccer field or an aquarium or stadium size where people, you really have space for all of their beauty, which isn't always Mm -hmm. beautiful too. It's dynamic. Mm -hmm. There's a lot to that. And so I think by going through this, I think before I went through this, first of all, I had no idea. I had no clue how bad divorce was. I'd hear somebody was getting separated or whatever. And and I would even probably be judgmental. I'd be like, yeah, you're not trying very hard. Or have you even looked at therapy or like, you know, judging Mm. the fuck out of them. And just unnecessarily, because I remember looking at my lawyer being like, I can't believe 50% of the married people have done this over that. It blew my mind to know how many people had been through this level of pain. So instead of me feeling like you're walking into a Bible study and I'm like, judging you. I became the girl in the back with a martini and a cigarette. I don't even smoke. And like, I'm just welcoming you back, like come here and tell me your story. And so I think my shift really helped. It challenged prejudices I had in my own spirit about things like divorce. And it challenged me to the deeper levels of suffering. I believe suffering recognizes suffering. Mm-hmm. I believe that if you've been to those really deep levels Someone who has also been there recognizes that in you. And I think that that can also make you feel safer to share. So if you meet somebody who's really upbeat and super nice, but is two dimensional and clearly Mm -hmm. hasn't maybe seen a lot of death or sickness or divorce or whatever, bankruptcy, these horrible Mm -hmm. things, you're probably less likely to share your own story. But if you meet somebody who you know their story and it's similar to yours in terms of the level of suffering, Mm -hmm. I think you're a lot more likely to share. So I think it was twofold. I think it was me responding to my own story and changing and changing, actually going and getting help to get better. And then I think it was my clients maybe feeling that I have seen some shit. And so you don't have to necessarily like hide from me dark things. Well, and I'm just thinking about one of the things Brene Brown always said is vulnerability is the first thing that I look for in you, but it's the last thing I want you to see in me. But I think that when we do tune into somebody else's vulnerability and it's a welcoming space, then we do share our own vulnerabilities too. And I think that's it, right? We are connecting in the wounded healer space because it's much more, I don't know, maybe it, I was gonna say, I was gonna say it's much more fun to like connect on trauma than it is just like I love puppies. Um, but I guess they're both fun. But I don't know. Someone like me who spends their life swimming in this water, I just don't understand anybody who doesn't want to do the deep dive into their own psyche. That's just I don't know how you live if that's what you're doing. But that's just me. <laughs> but also, so I've been thinking about, like I said, the anti-racism stuff. I'm thinking about the concept of equity. And not just equity in terms of race and justice and all that sort of stuff. But I feel like we're in an age now where we all have such a deep desire to be met, to be seen, to be known. And when you said what your prejudgments were on divorce and then now having gone through it, like there's a part of me that I want for everyone to feel met, to feel seen. And yet at the same time, it's an unreasonable expectation for everybody to be able to understand all of the things, right? My parents are both dead. And for me, it's actually been positive. It has been a positive thing. Mm -hmm. And so 
I can relate to other people who've lost parents who had really difficult relationships with them, but I can't relate to somebody who misses their dead parent. Right. So it's yeah, the nuances. I wonder if as a society, we can start building a little tolerance for the normal differences and build more space for equity at the same time. Does any of that make sense? Yes. Makes total sense. I think the other part is too is, and this goes back to that deep inner work internally. I believe that the more inner work you've done, the less threatening difference is. Yes. And the more beautiful it is. Perfectly said. (laughs) So that's it. it. I feel like it comes back full circle to, again, the more you work on internally, like I was not resistant to changing my perspective around divorce because I was experiencing it and I've done a lot of inner work. And I do truly think that other people's perspectives are beautiful. And I actually think it's the grace of also allowing the other person to be fully who they are. You know, sometimes you get these political narratives, these racial narratives where there is no grace for the other person to exist in any way, whether it's threatening or pleasant, or it's just, I don't want any response from you whatsoever. I just want to be heard and understood. Mm -hmm. And I want you to conform. Exactly, exactly. This becomes like a complete dictatorship. Yeah, yeah. And that's the thing that I think is killing some political parties. I think that's the thing that's killing some religious movements. If you do not have faith. Is it killing them though? (laughs) I hope so. I just learned that 25% of America is evangelical and that scares the fuck out of me. That is a statistic from the census data. You know, that's interesting that you say that because you're right. I say it's killing it because I'm a member of the church. I believe in Jesus and I am completely like shaming, shutting. Mm-hmm. I was supposed to say shaming, I shedding. Say that, but mm, shedding, shedding yeah. the perspective around evangelicals because it doesn't represent Jesus at all. Exactly. Like, and I don't know how you could possibly ever read anything in scripture where he is this socialist. Why would Trump be the guy to like hang your hat on? I don't like it. Doesn't, it doesn't make sense. Like it doesn't make sense. It literally yeah. just might. I mean, it, it's mm-hmm. like you're talking about a different person. And so. Yeah, I say that to say, you're right. There are probably some movements that are growing. And again, you know what the big divide is going to be is inner work. That's it. Because if you've done the inner work, you want to keep stripping down. You want to keep finding truth. You have space for differences. If you have it, then you're going to put every single buffer you can possibly place in front of you and your pain so you never have to touch it. So if that's the collateral damage of your neighbors, your mom, your relationships, your job, your political, like your reputation, then you will stack that, all of that against that door. So no one has to actually touch the pain of what their childhood wound actually is. Right, right. And of course, we've talked about religion so much on this podcast. It's not that religion is bad, but I do think the piece that I don't know that has been talked about enough is the power, the power hoarding that happens at the top of those Mm -hmm. organizations, often by straight quote unquote straight, because sometimes we find out later that they're not uh, white men, right, who are saying what's right and what's wrong. And I was reading an article today. Have you heard of the birds aren't real conspiracy theory? No, but I'm loving it that we started. (laughs) This is wild. Yeah. So, right. We started talking about kicking birds and now we can kick them because they're just robots. (laughs) But no. So I found this thing on TikTok and it freaked me out. I'm like, do people really believe that birds aren't real? So the thing It actually started as just a fucked up experiment. This kid went out during the Women's March in D.C. after Trump was elected and he just held up a sign that said birds aren't real and then started having basically from his vantage point, fake discussions saying that the CIA had replaced all of the birds and they're all now robots and they're watching us and they're giving information to the government. So he's full of shit and he knows he's full of shit, but then it takes off. And it like, I was just going to say, you know, it's really sad. It's literally, as you're saying this, I have at least 20 people in my head yeah. who would right. believe it. So it's like, right, man. Right. So this thing is taking off. And I don't even remember why I fucking started to tell this story, but there's something about, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I remember what it was. The reason is to believe in a conspiracy theory, it's faith. You are putting faith in something that has no proof other than the proof that people are putting out there. And that's, I think, the way that a lot of religions can harm people when it's practiced not as Jesus intended. So if, if they're saying, yeah, Jesus wants you to hurt doctors who help people get abortions, Jesus doesn't fucking want that. 
that no, he was that is not no, what Jesus is. wants. Jesus is like, I didn't say that shit. Right. So <laughs> it's people using what they are calling faith when really it's just brainwashing and indoctrination. Well, I would argue most people that I know in the church who are still what I would consider a faithful believer, what I would consider you actually know who Christ and his teaching and your life reflects your li- it. Right, like I right. see the evidence yes. of mm-hmm. what he taught and how you spend your time, mm-hmm. your money, your energy, all of that. I believe that if you, I'm not going to say always, because I'm very hesitant to say always, but most of us would have had to have some kind of deconstruction at some point. Yeah. And the reason is exactly what you're saying. It doesn't mean that my church growing up was terrible, whatever. It means that patriarchy was literally sewed into this. And Jesus literally appeared to women first. So right off the bat, like you're not doing great. (laughs) That's not where he landed. He did not come to the bureaucracy in the city and pull the white dudes out to say, hi, I'm here. I raised. Mm -hmm. And that was when they were considered property. Mm -hmm. Like, and he let them spread the news. He let them go. And so I think that when I look at the way the church is shaped, I think it is incredibly adept at giving you things to buffer your pain if you don't want to deal with it. Right. It is also adept if you want to unpack and you want to actually do the wrestling and the hard work and show up the way that God created you to be in your own unique spirit, then I think it can actually bring a lot of healing because my healing came through the church, but it also had to break a lot of the trauma from the church. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's both and. Yes, it's both and, yes. But I will say, I mean, I think because I live in Atlanta, I'm surrounded by a pretty diverse populate because I'm in the city. I think I probably have a different perspective because I know when I drive 30 minutes in any direction, it looks like a completely different thing. Yeah. So church may be growing, but I think we're going to see some mass exoduses in the future, both from church, I would say church politics, and then probably teaching as well. There are just some systems that are so beyond broken. They're not sustainable. So they're just going to break at some point, but like fully break. Mm -hmm. Right. Again, we're just going to destroy things because humans are cute like that. Anyway, um, <laughs> you yeah, you like that. yeah. So would you consider yourself a healer? I would. I would. I, I hesitate because it makes me afraid to own a title like that because there's so much. Well, we're not putting it on your business cards. Don't worry. OK, yes. <laughs> it's not going to be slapped up on your website. <laughs> also known as Helix. No, I think that is certainly my goal is to offer a different perspective offer a safe space for women who have never identified their bodies as their own. Mm. That's something very prevalent in the South. And that's also tied to kind of the church narrative. Your bodies are for men and for Mm -hmm. babies. And I firmly disagree. It's your body. It's what you live your life in. So it's yours first. And I think if I can dispel any of the lies you believe about your physical form or just encourage you, because I think the thing people don't realize is that and I said this to you, sexuality is 90% about your soul. It's only like 10% about sex. It's what you're doing when you're having sex is you are connecting to another soul on a basic level as a being with thoughts, dreams, preferences, passions, not as a mom or CEO or whatever. And so I think understanding that, that means the same place that passionate sex comes from, other things come from, like your autonomy as an individual, as a soul, your dreams or what delights you, art, beauty, film, story. I think as soon as you start to cut off, and again, especially in the church, we're taught as soon as you feel urges, it's bad, it's negative, get it out, root it out, which means Mm -hmm. as you're developing, the last part of you coming into the fullness of who you are supposed to be right. gets cut off, literally like a limb severed from your body. And bonus, you get told not only those urges and that desire and all those drives, like you need to ignore them and get them away, but you actually need to figure out your own worth based on people around you. Growing up, I was supposed to be pretty, virginal, yeah, and quiet. Fuck that shit. I, I was. Yeah. You were um, one yeah. of those things. We'll um, let everybody guess. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's the thing is like it's one of those I know you were two of those things just kidding it's two yes it's two yeah sorry which, which ones, ones? <laughs> but that becomes completely unsustainable because you never know what somebody really thinks of you ever even when you're married to them you may be like oh they love me and they <laughs> maybe they they're annoyed or frustrated and so you put yourself on this wild goose chase of constantly trying to pick up subtle cues. It's like you have that emotional radar constantly going to figure out if you're fitting in the way you should or not. And I wonder what would happen if instead of meeting kids when they're adolescents at 12, 13, 14, 15, 
if we invited all of those urges and those moments to sit at the table and if they could have a safe space to unpack right. how it feels to build that relationship in yourself, because a lot of emotions actually present very similarly. Like when you get excited or nervous or scared, all three of those elevated heart rate, your face will get flushed. You'll get a little sweaty, can't get clammy. What tells right. you you're scared right. versus excited? What tells you which one it is? And really, it's your gut. That's the only difference is your gut will light up or it will shrink in and want to be done. And so I think we really do a disservice to kids when they hit this age. We should be fostering and shepherding that relationship so they can know their voice better and figure out who they are instead of shunning and shaming and shutting it all down and then demanding that they just perform and behave in a certain way without ever connecting that to their spirit. I wonder how many great people that we would have heard about and would have made great inventions or done huge things for our population. And they didn't because they learned really early. It was about what other people thought. Greatness doesn't come from a place of safety. It never will. It has to come from a place of risk. And if you're not safe enough to risk, you won't. There is a quote right there. (laughs) Yes. Pull that one out. (laughs) Tell the editor and she will. Yeah, no, absolutely. (laughs) I think too about objectification, because if pleasure is bad, except within the context of utility, like have children, it's putting a lot of pressure. And the human body has so many ways to experience pleasure with oneself and with others, right? And so for whatever reason, why is that threatening? probably because it's empowering, right? Anything that's empowering to women or people who are different than the cis white male that's expected to show up in the church spaces as leaders, empowering of anything other than that is probably what's threatening. I definitely agree with that. I also think even for your typical patriarchal white man, I believe there is an opportunity. They could show up in such a way where they could show up authentically Mm -hmm. or they can lean into the system, which is what's happened. But I believe that if we can... Not all white men are bad. We know this. No, no. (laughs) I am married to one. He's fabulous. I'm divorced from one, but no. (laughs) We won't go there. Um, No, I think I... And yes, I have many white men that I love, love, love. But I do think that within the confines of understanding, I'm confused as to why we don't have body classes. Why wouldn't that be part of education? Mm -hmm. Because I truly believe, and you mentioned it earlier, like your body responding to pleasure. I believe our bodies shout at us all the time. Mm -hmm. And I didn't hear my body until last year when I was getting divorced. My body was the first one to tell me, you're not okay. You're not safe. Get out. I'd break into the sweat or just intimacy. My body wouldn't turn on. My body knew exactly where it was. My brain had to catch up. Exactly. But often we do it the reverse. Our brain is convincing Mm -hmm. our body. No, you're safe. You're fine. No, we're good. That's the connection that I feel like is broken for all of us. Mm -hmm. And I think that people who are going for inner work are healing that connection. That's more important than math. That's more important than anything that I've learned is how to cue into my body's cues. Because again, at the end of the day, we're animals too. There are things that are going to happen. There's fight, flight, fawn. We have a lot of information that we don't necessarily know what to do with. And I wish it was more not only just mainstream, because I don't even believe this stuff has to do with therapy. We typically use these tools to undo trauma. But what if we use these tools to grow into who we need to be? (gasps) Like, what if that was the thing? Right. Well, if everyone cared about actual self-actualization, that would be amazing. So I'm looking at the clock and I'm like, oh, man, I wish I didn't have an appointment right after this because I would love to extend this. But here we are. So, yes. How do people get in contact with you? How would they book a session with you? What is that like? They can definitely go to my website. It is Megan, M-E-A-G-A-N, the letter O, and then photography.com. So you can send me something through my contact form there. And then we've got lots of stuff that we're going to be rolling out. So there are many things in the future. So if you're curious at all about any of that, that would be a way to stay in touch. Mm -hmm. And you do, obviously, boudoir is your jam. You do Nike photos. You also do really kick-ass branding photos too. So are you open to Thank like you. all of those sorts of things? I'm open to a branding photo sessions. Yes, yeah. so it would be something that we just discuss. You got to show up sporting like amazing tattoos and a rainbow. Like, yeah, you got to be Sarah, basically. Yeah, <laughs> I'm very open to that. 
awesome. You don't have to have the rainbow mohawk. <laughs> right. Although right. it makes it way more fun if you do. It sure does. It sure does. Well, we talked about everything and this went in really cool directions that I did not expect today. But is there anything you want to leave listeners with? You know, I probably I would actually have a question for you when you were done with your session. It's been a few weeks now and we haven't really connected since about a month ago. Mm -hmm. How has your session felt or evolved or what has that experience been for you? Hmm. You know, if there weren't such other crazy extraneous things happening, I probably would have spent more time with them. I think I will come back to that when I put my new website together and actually mm -hmm. use the photos. Because yes. right now it's just like, okay, I put them up on Facebook. I mean, you saw they have like <laughs> hundreds of likes now. So everyone really loves should. them, right? <laughs> so yes, the photos were amazing. A wonderful feedback. I haven't been with them since I left you, basically, is what it is. Okay. So yeah, I'll check in again when I start to build the website and I start to work with them. I would love to hear that. But my friend Livia that came to see the photos, her dad was a photographer. And so she's like, oh, yeah, I know. I'll help you pick out the good ones. And later she's like, this is going to elevate you. And you don't even know what you're in for. These photos, this is next level shit. Oh, I love that. Congratulations. I feel like you elevated the photos. I'll just say that. You were the one like it was your soul, your spirit. Your listeners know who you are. It definitely reads in images, too. Oh, yeah. Well, thank you for being here. My it's great pleasure. to spend this time together. Yeah, this is great. I love it so much. I've yeah. really enjoyed my time here. Awesome. Well, we'll be in touch soon. Don't worry. <laughs> Sounds good. Thanks so much to Megan for being a great guest today. To learn more about Megan, you can go to our website at www.headhearttherapy.com slash podcast. Thanks as always to Andrea Klunder and the Creative Imposter Studios for editing, to Liam O'Donnell for the album art, and to Ben Mueller for our theme music. Until next time, bye-bye.